My name is Jackie Schertz, and welcome to Hey Listen. Today's topic is AIDS. I have two guests with me today. First, I have Sam Edwards, who has come here from New York City. We're very honored to have him here. And we also have Father Ray Fleming. During my discussion with them, while I was preparing for this program, there's one thing that I learned. AIDS itself is not a fatal disease. Many people live with AIDS until they die. And so stay with us, we'll be right back. This portion of Hey Listen is sponsored by Wegmans. Before Wegmans introduced a family video department, we decided we'd have the biggest library with special attention to new releases and quantity, all on a quick service computer system, membership free, rental price is the lowest. We send you home to the movies. And when it comes from Wegmans, you know that it's our best. Wegmans in Wegmans home video and everything we do, we're more committed than ever to getting better than ever. Welcome back. We're discussing the issue of AIDS today, and we're very honored to have our two guests with us. We have Sam Edwards, who's from New York City. He was a former actor, dancer. He taught sign language. And he's been involved in many different activities related to film, stage, and TV. We also have Ray Fleming, Father Ray Fleming, who is the priest for St. Mary's Church for the Deaf here in Rochester, New York. He's also involved strongly with AIDS Rochester, and he's a liaison between the church and deaf people with AIDS. He also works as a case manager and is trying to establish a buddy system here in Rochester to work with people with AIDS. We have quite a large audience here today, and, and Sam, I have to start out asking you why you have this interesting type of hat on. A lot of people have been a bit curious about that. Could you tell us? So, so you really want to know, huh? Okay. Well, you see, my hat, a lot of people wonder what it's for. I mean, does this relate to being a hearing person or a deaf person? I have to tell you, it really doesn't matter. When I, about 14 or 15 years ago is when I really started using my hat. Hearing or deaf people often identify me as, the, you know, the guy with the hat. They might not know my name, but he's a wonderful dancer. The guy with the hat, you know? The fellow that wears the hat. I don't know his name, but he's... You know, it really became my trademark. I became famous. I'm sure many of you have trademarks as well. Maybe an earring or a nose ring or a specific bracelet or any manner of thing that might help identify you. Some people wonder if my hat is related to, my, to a religion, a Jewish. They have small hats and they wear them more on the back of their head. I have sort of a big head, a fat head, some people would say, so I wear a hat like this. So it has nothing to do with the religion. It's just pretty. It's just beautiful. It's sort of an art statement for me to wear a hat. Well, I'm bald, of course. I should mention that. Really, I started 14 or 15 years ago. And perhaps you wonder if I have just one hat. No, I have several, all different colors. You know, like how some women have uh, Underwear for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Well, I have hats for every day of the week. Sometimes I wear a white hat, sometimes a black hat, or the colors of the rainbow. I mean, I have every different kind of hat. Friends give them to me, some from Egypt. Those are beautiful, the ones that I sent was sent from Egypt. Well, I, I don't want to run on, but someone, someone sent me one from Macau and all other different places. It's impressive, I like it. I'm impressed by these gifts. But it, the reason I wear it is that's my trademark, and I don't want to hear any more about it. 
So that's why today when I picked you up at the airport, your suitcase was so heavy. It was stuffed full of your hat collection. <laughs> I only have two with me this time. Oh, okay. Well, now people are starting to wonder, gee, I thought I came here to talk about AIDS, but here we are talking about ads. Yeah. We should probably get back to the topic at hand. Um, so when we saw you on TV, there's a, there's a TV program that's produced by Gallaudet called Deaf Bosaic. And while you were on that show, um, you were talking about living with AIDS. And you said that that taught you more about understanding life. Could you please explain what you meant by that? I should explain a bit about Deaf Mosaic. They had very limited time, and they edited what was three hours of an in interview into just a few minutes oh, through editing. I see. And it was just quite a, compl a summarization. But uh, to answer your question, before AIDS, I was quite a devilish and mischievous fellow. I went to all kinds of parties. I mean, I sure probably shouldn't say it now, but I got around. I did everything. And I had led a very creative life. I experimented with a lot of different things. I went to a lot of parties. I would do anything. And when I learned that I had AIDS, I mean, I became real quiet. I mean, Sam the party man, the real animal, became a real quiet person, a quiet Sam. Quite slow and quite very thoughtful. It really struck me. And I became quite quiet about it. And I saw dancers on television, and I, I had a longing to do it, but I, my motivation, my energy was just gone. In some ways, it just didn't feel like me. It didn't feel like Sam. I felt like a different person all of a sudden. And I've learned a lot, not just about AIDS, but about hospitals, too. I went into the hospital. I mean, that was a mistake. I went into the, you know, the hospitals are really for hearing people, not deaf people. Do you know this? Let me tell you that, I mean, I was fortunate in some ways. I mean, I have a lot of friends, both deaf and hearing, that came to visit me. And some of them would come and interpret for me. And I would ask them to interpret it. And one girl came, and she stayed for 24 hours with me, watching me and interpreting all through the night. She took care of me. And I, I asked her, I asked my friends what was going on. And I began to understand a lot more about life and realized that friends are very important. I learned a lot from my friends. <clears throat> As I was lying there, some of the nurses and doctors were pretty mean. They didn't know how to, to uh, take blood. I mean, they would, it would, they would be really painful about it. They would move the needle all around once they got it in. And I said, hey, you work in this hospital? Have you worked there long? I mean, it was really awful. There was quite a lot of terrible things that I saw. However, there were some positive things, and there was also the negative. I saw a lot. I mean, for people that are healthy, you know, they're sitting there having a good time. You know, you can hear, listen about AIDS and think it's nothing. But when it's, once it hits you, it really sets you back. I mean, you have to learn to share, to learn to share with people about it. I mean, if you don't want to share with people, that's OK. That's your decision. But I'm open. You might wonder why you should maybe be willing to share with people, because at some point, you might be lying on the bed wondering what to do. And you might cry and think that maybe it's God's punishment. He's angry with you, and he's giving you AIDS as a result. But that's not it. It has nothing to do with God. AIDS is just something that goes in you. That's it. Yeah, when you first found out that you had AIDS, um, what were your first reactions? Did you say, I'm not ready for this? And did you feel anger? And did you want to stay away from your friends because you didn't want them to pity you? How did you react? This is around 1980. There was a lot of rumor going around about AIDS, you know? A lot of news, a lot of gossip. Somebody call, some people called it the gay cancer. And I heard about that. There was a lot of rumor, a lot of talk on the streets about it. And I saw some friends that, that might have got it. And of course, you know, I hung out with a lot of guys. You know, it doesn't matter if you're married or straight or what. 
There's not a lot of sex happening. Married people that stay together for a long time, you know, and have sex with one another, sometimes they go out on each other, have an affair. But with gay people, different than married people, it's very different. Their culture is, is very unique. Many gay people go to bathhouses. They, they charge $10 for maybe eight hours. Maybe for straight people, you go $40 for an hour with a woman. But with gay people, there's many people that go to these bathhouses. And they just go there to have sex. And there's a lot of VD there. It's very easy to get venereal disease. When I was there, I got an STD, a sexually transmitted disease. And I didn't think anything about it. I got taken care of. But as I read more in the newspaper, there was quite a bit of bad press about this. So I would sort of practice for myself and think, well, I wonder if I have AIDS and what would it be like? But when the day came that they told me I had AIDS, I sort of suspected that I might have it. And I thought, ah, shoot, you know? I mean, I really loved life. I really love life. I mean, I love it. This is really valuable, important to me. But at the same time, I have to realize that I need to accept death. So I thought I was ready, and I, and, and then when they told me that I had AIDS, I felt, this is all right. This is OK. I'll go to the doctor and see what happens. I went to the doctor and got all the tests, and they told me I had AIDS, and I had KS. You know what K is? is? How do you spell it? K-A-P-O-S-I. Kaposi. Sarcoma. Sarcoma. Right. It's these purple things, these purple spots that you get. Lesions, they're all over you. There's one here, see? I mean, this was my first lesion, right here. Before I saw the doctor, I had this. Some people get white a film sort of on their tongue. Now, two years before this, in 1987, I had gotten this white stuff on my tongue. So I went to the dentist and said, hey, what's this stuff on my tongue? What's going on? And the dentist said, well, you know, you just have this, this illness. Uh, it's really OK. It's not a big deal. So I went to the dentist again and again and again. I just didn't know what was going on. I mean, he had no idea what this was about. I mean, can you imagine this? I mean, this, this, this white stuff didn't hurt me. It didn't bother me. It was just sort of this white covering or film on my tongue. So I went to the doctor, and he says, you have AIDS. Well, OK. And, and I had Kaposi sarcoma. And I had PCP. Uh, it's a kind of pneumonia. So I listened very carefully, and I took this. I accepted it. The doctor says, you better go to the hospital. You have a week before you'll die, and you don't want to delay this. I said, a week? I mean, I wasn't shocked. I wasn't, like, you know, grieving and crying and wa weeping and wailing. I just listened very carefully to the man, and he said that I was done, and I should go to the hospital. And I said I didn't want to. And the reason is that I want to maintain my health. I want to eat healthy things. And in the hospital, they don't have menus like that. I mean, they have medicine and inhalers and all this other stuff. And I'd never experienced that sort of stuff. You know, the only time I'd ever been in the hospital was to have my tonsils out when I was nine years old. I've never been in a hospital since then. Never. I was a good boy. I'd been a good boy. Until I was 26. And then I learned a lot about life. I mean, things that I'd never experienced before. All these things that, uh, that became a part of my life experience, it was, it was hard. I wanted to avoid people. Uh, I became careless in some ways. I didn't realize some things. I guess that's it. Oh, thank you. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Father Red, I'd like to turn to you for a minute and talk to you as a priest. Um, I know the church often has strong anti-gay uh, sentiments and activities. And I'm wondering about AIDS in Rochester. I'm, I'm wondering what the church's response to your work with them is. I'm wondering if you're getting any ramifications from the higher-ups about what you're doing. 
Well, it's not rebellious, really. Some of the people in the church might have a bias against gay people, but it doesn't permeate the church. It really doesn't. Here in Rochester, the bishop wrote a letter and sent that out, explained one of the ways we need to look at people who have AIDS is with love. We need to have love for all people. We can't judge our fellow people, and that's all. And really, I try to do that. I think it's really exciting to be here in Rochester. We have a large deaf community. Several of my friends are doctors who've gone to see some quilting projects. There is a quilt project going on. That doctor came back and was really impressed, really shocked at how many deaf people were involved. And the doctor hadn't expected that. He'd expected to see black and Hispanic people, but hadn't expected at all to see that number of deaf people. And it appears that a lot of minority groups are not yet really well informed. And I realized that. I remember when I went to see some friends in Texas, I traveled to quite a few different communities. And I'm involved with a variety of retreats related to the Catholic Church. One Mexican person in Texas had told me that they'd stopped using cocaine. They had used cocaine for a while, and they finally stopped. And not only that, that wasn't all. I understood that they were getting partial information. They just weren't getting the whole story. And Rochester's taken a strong interest here in making sure that the deaf community is informed. And it's deaf people who have really taken the leadership roles That's in good. getting the word out to the deaf community. So I'm just trying to be part of that process and involved in that process. AIDS education is something that I didn't have. I just sort of learned it from friends, you know, from sharing. I mean, this is really quite a different approach that he's speaking about. Yeah, so we have two different viewpoints here, and it's very nice to help people feel more comfortable and, and learn how to behave appropriately about this issue. Talking about people's behavior, I'm wondering, I, I know a lot of people respond differently, and a lot of people come up to you and say, oh, how are you? I know that I tended to have that first inclination be before I met you, but if you know, you almost feel that a person with AIDS is a member of the walking dead. You know, you don't know how to address them. I, I don't know if I should ask, how are you? Is that an okay question, or is that out of bounds, or is that appropriate? What do you think about that? For me, it really doesn't matter. You can ask me anything. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They're only words. I mean, I know I might soon die, so why should I be that excited about it? I mean, I'm looking forward to life, and I'm being very positive, trying to keep a smile on. In 1974, sometimes people would ask me who I was. A lot of hearing people would talk to me about that. they said, say, well, you can't hear, you're deaf. I'd say, yes, I'm deaf, I can't hear. they said, well, but you can dance. How do you do this? And <laughs> you've probably heard this story, right? So, I mean, a deaf person would say, oh, you're a dancer, that's great, ah, you gotta be hearing. No. So, the hear these both hearing and deaf people have some of the same misconceptions about this. And now when I see them both asking me this question of who I am, I mean, sometimes I don't understand, and I'm not sure, and I don't know why. So I bought a book called Self Help or it was a self-help type book, you know, sort of self-understanding, you know? <laughs> Not about other people and trying to understand them, but trying to understand me. And this book changed my life. This book, it took me two years to read it. And after I read this book, I figured I pretty much knew who I was. I mean, I wasn't really <laughs> egotistical about it, but I had a good sense of who I was, a good self-understanding why you know i was born and and that i love to dance and that i was going to accept death and all this stuff this book was about talked about death 
And as I read it, it changed my fear of death to accepting. I mean, I learned a lot from this book. I mean, when you're born, it's a given that you're going to die. I mean, when you look at a flower and you look at it's being so beautiful, I mean, are these real? <laughs> oh, yes, Good. they are. Um, <laughs> so, you know, on TV, sometimes they use fake flowers, so I want to know. Sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. I just wondered if the flowers were real. Um, the flowers you see here, when you look at them, you see them as being beautiful. Tomorrow, they're going to die. Does that bother you? I mean, some people are shocked by the thought of death, but it's just another thing. I mean, in some ways, it's really not fair, you know? It's just not fair. Animals die, and you don't suffer or, or, or grieve for them, and you're going to die as well. I mean, if you are constantly afraid or thinking about death all the time, it's not going to be such a good life. So you need to have a positive outlook and just accept the idea of death. When people come and visit me, I try to analyze who they are and, and what they have to say to me. Some people say, oh, you're very thin and, and you look terrible. And some people go around the corner and cry. And I know what's going on. I try to analyze why they have these responses and who they are. You know, in some ways, it's sort of like, I, well, I can see the people as they come around the door. They compose themselves before they see me. They straighten up and dry their eyes. I mean, and I look at them and want to ask them, is that a real smile or are you just being polite with me? I mean, I just try to let people be sad or smile or do whatever they want. They have the right, and I have the right to sit there and watch them. <laughs> so as I have all these visitors, and I check them all out, in some ways I'm very lucky to have this positive outlook. I mean, I don't mean that, that you who are interested in being pessimistic can, can maintain this for yourself. That's all right. If you want to, you know, that's your business. But I'm going to be an optimist, and that's who I am. I, I have one more thing that I really want to get to, and then we'll open it up to the audience participation. I'd like to talk about sex and, and our view of that as a basic human need. There are very few of us who go on who never experience sex. Um, some people do OK at that, but I'm wondering um, what you think about sex now? I can't live without it. I can't live without sex. Really, but there's a big but that goes along with this. Before AIDS, I was involved with a lot of sex. I mean, I was really careless. It, it didn't matter to me. I was actually out of control. I was out of control. I didn't practice safe sex or anything. I mean, we did anything. I would just try to grab any experience I could get. Anything. That was really how I defined myself in some ways. And once I learned I had AIDS, that was the end of it. <laughs> that was all. I, I changed. I mean, I mean, I'd been in the, the deaf school, and I learned a lot when I was a boy. I'd hung out with a lot of boys. Now, do I miss sex? Well, I don't know. I've had a variety of different boys, 1,000, maybe 2,000. <laughs> maybe some of you are jealous. But, I mean, a lot of different experiences that I had. Black, fat, thin, tall, weird, intelligent. I learned a lot from all these people. And I was very open in my thinking. Before, I would think about black people, and I'd be afraid, I think. But once I went to bed with them, I realized they were human. And I, once I went to bed with a Jewish person, I realized that that was no big deal. They were human, too. And as I went to bed with all these per people, sex, well, in some ways, sex really opened my mind to realizing that everyone was human. Once I stopped, I mean, I just have no desire. I understand now how some people, I mean, there's that word for not having sex. Celibacy? Being That's celibate? It. Celibacy. You know, they're just not interested in having sex. They just don't have sex. And I understand this now. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the need for sex. In some ways, I sort of feel like a dove. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I want to have, you know, I don't, I don't even want to have like a quickie, you know, just or anything. I just want to meet people and talk with people. I mean, I look at people and I'm excited by them and I flirt with people, but I don't want to go to bed with people. 
For the last four weeks, I've been having a lot of dreams about sex. <laughs> and I'm trying to analyze this for myself and figure out what this means. And I have these dreams about dildos, swinging them around in my sleep. And I try to analyze for this myself. What am I thinking about? I don't know where this is coming from. It's sort of weird. OK, now I'm sure that there are some people in the audience who are interested in raising some questions here. I was wondering, how did, did you tell your parents or your friends after you, real, after you discovered that you had AIDS? So, I mean, did I walk up to these people and just blurt it out? Yeah, after you dis discovered this, did you go ahead and tell people, or how did you manage that? Before I learned I had it, I sort of had some, some suspicions, and I didn't announce those. I had some suspicions. People would ask me to say, oh, you're looking really tired. And I said, that's all right. You don't have to say anything about it. It's OK, I know. I tended to be sort of a private person. I mean, very private person, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you know, I was so open. Uh, so when I learned I had AIDS, I went to my friends and said, I have AIDS. And I wasn't shy about it or anything, or ashamed or anything. I was not ashamed of it. I mean, I just accepted it. I mean, it's part of life. It's part of my life. I went around telling my friends. I mean, I didn't ask them all to come and talk to me or anything. But I spoke with my family. They were upset. They were concerned. They, they hugged me. But I would say I'm very fortunate. <coughs> Okay, we have another question right here. I would like to ask for some advice. I know a particular couple. One is HIV positive and has known that for a while. And decided to stop having sex. Decided to stop having sex. I understand that person's feelings and my question is, does that person, if he doesn't want to be involved with other people's lives because he's afraid that he might hurt other people, um, he's depressed about it at this point. And I want to know how I could tell him that it's okay or that, you know, this, the other member of the couple, they could have safer sex or that he shouldn't be afraid of infecting someone else. How can I tell him so that he's not afraid? Okay. Okay, could you hold on a second, Sam? I'd like to continue this discussion, but we really need to take a break for a message from our sponsor. And so, if you hold on to that question, we'll get back to it right when we come back. Stay tuned. portion of Hey Listen has been sponsored by Wegmans. Before Wegmans introduced a family video department, we decided we'd have the biggest library with special attention to new releases and quantity, all on a quick service computer system, membership free, rental price is the lowest. We send you home to the movies. And when it comes from Wegmans, you know that it's our best. In Wegman's home video and everything we do, we're more committed than ever to getting better than ever. I don't know what to do. I have nowhere to go. No, I went to my friend's house and their parents won't let me come in and my mom and dad won't let me come back in the house. Yes. Um, I'm 14. Lifeline. Help. Information and referral for human services, 24 hours, 275-5151. This portion of Hey Listen is sponsored by Aladdin's Natural Eatery. Aladdin's Natural Eatery. All natural soups and salads. Greek specialties fresh squeezed juices, 
and imported beers from all over the world. Fine Middle Eastern dining after 5 at 141 State Street. Middle Eastern cuisine for the gourmet, the vegetarian, and the health food enthusiast. Hello and welcome back. We're continuing with our AIDS program and we have Sam Edwards with us and Father Ray Fleming. At the end of our first part, we had someone who was asking a question. We'd like to get him to recap this statement. So could we have him restate that again, please? Yes, I was looking for some advice for a friend of mine. One of the members of a couple that I know has HIV and is afraid to have sex. Do you have any advice that I could give this person? <coughs> uh, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a counselor. Um, someone... I'm, I'm not a counselor. Oh, excuse me, I missed something again. Could I ask you? You... You said... No, okay. I'm not. I, I don't dispense advice. I mean, I can't read people's minds. Either of the partner's minds. What I might suggest is that they go to see a therapist or they get in a group where they can have a discussion about this. It's a lot better than me as a single person giving some story or some advice, you know, this is the best thing to do or that's the best thing to do. I mean, that might really screw up the person. So I would suggest it should be careful. I mean, I just really don't know how to advise people or counsel people and I'm not a counselor. I mean, I have my own life experience, but that's about it. Thanks for your question. Okay, I think we have someone else who has a question here. I noticed in the newspaper and media, there's many facts about AIDS. Oh, poor people with AIDS. And I was wondering, people with cancer don't have the same thing. We're not hearing as much about cancer. Why is that? that why can't we keep our attention on both of these diseases? That's a good question. Cancer's sort of an old thing, you know? It's been around for many years, and people have gotten used to the idea of it. Back in the 50s, people would talk about cancer and become afraid. I mean, it's just like AIDS is now. It's interesting. I mean, it's, ver uh, it's a, a parallel sort of development. People were afraid of it. They, they didn't know what it was or how you got it or anything, but now it's sort of passe, you know? AIDS is the, the end disease. I mean, 30 years from now, AIDS will be no big deal. I mean, right now, people are freaking out on it. You know, so I'm sure there'll be some other disease, and it, it sort of goes on a cyclical kind of thing. It's sort of crazy. OK, here. I have concerns about deaf students. The Rochester School for the Deaf, all around international actually different schools do they have sex education are they being educated about AIDS because kids are going to be experimenting with sex and that is a real concern of mine should we allow sex education in schools for the deaf for example do you have a response to that my desire is for everyone to know about this disease to know about AIDS from you know, when they're a child, from their parents, from the church. I don't know so much about your church, Ray, but, uh, you know, I mean, everyone should know about this. It should be out. It's important for people to have sex education, to teach children. I mean, it's not to teach children to become sexy or anything. I mean, it's just to teach them about AIDS and how to be careful and how to prevent the transmission of disease. I mean, not sexy the way I used to be. I mean... It's hard sometimes for the government to legislate stuff like that, and it's hard for people to ask the government for it. You know, the government might just might, you know, ignore the request and, and, and not give it attention. In schools for the deaf, you know, sometimes there's some very closed-minded attitudes there, and, and it's very difficult to change a closed-minded attitude, an administrator especially. So, you know, what you can do first is educate yourself and change yourself. And once you enlighten yourself and people come to you and say, what's going on? 
you know, now you can, you'll have a better approach. People will be interested and motivated rather than trying to convince people who are, are backing away from you and are afraid. I mean, that's my wish, is that people would know about this. When you talk about education, I can see that a lot of people are wearing these black buttons with a pink triangle in them, and it says silence equals death. And I see a lot of people wearing these buttons. I see one right out here in the audience. Maybe some people don't understand what this means. You know, Jewish people had a yellow Star of David that they had to wear. You've seen it maybe? It's a yellow star. And gay people were given a pink triangle. This was, this was in the old days, you see. There was a variety. Deaf people, they were killed also. Blind people were killed also, as were gay people and Jewish people. And they all had different colors, different coding system. Red meant they were uh, uh, politically rebellious. And so that, that pink triangle talks about that. And then the next part is death equals silence. silence. No, equals silence death. equals death. That's the part. And the reason is that silence indicates ignorance. And people die from that. And we need to be spreading the word about this. We need to have people understand about it. It doesn't mean that because people are dead, they have to be quiet or something. I mean, it's, it's, the idea is to spread awareness and for people to understand more. And that's what that's about. OK, here we go with another one. I have really oh, hold have, on just a second. I have two questions that are related. Before, <coughs> I was very involved in I had several experiences as was involved, had a, a lot of parting and involved with sex. And then AIDS got to be more in the media. And I'm wondering, what do you have advice for me at this point? Oh, that's a question. My life isn't like other people's lives. So I really can't tell you what to do. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't chide people for this. I would say to you, you know, do you, I would ask people, do you know about AIDS? You ought to watch out. I'm not much sure what else you can do. I don't like chiding people and giving people a hard time. I like to be independent when I was growing up. You know, I had the parents, house parents and the uh, schools for the deaf, and they told me a lot of things that I couldn't do, and I didn't like it. And a lot of people gave me a hard time, so not, and I don't wish to do that to others. Well, I think by human nature, people tend to do exactly the opposite of what parents and authority figures tell us to do. And so I think if you give people options and tell them that it's their choice, you know, then, then they're le less likely to rebel and they're more likely to control it and take care of themselves. I, I think just by saying no, that's not the right way to handle it. So far, this has been a very positive discussion. Have you ever felt bitter or scared anytime? Because I've read and I've heard other stories of people who are very frightened and who go into hiding and don't want to be in touch with other people outside. And I'm wondering if you have ever felt at any moment this kind of feeling. In 1974, when I got this self-help book, that really helped me a lot to learn about this. When people talk to me about fears, I mean, I have to say I've never experienced death before. I mean, I'm curious what, it, what it's like, what it looks like. Sometimes when I sit and think about it, I mean, you get this sort of crazy picture of death, you know, or something. I mean, or do, do you smile when, you, when you're dead, or, or do you die when you're dancing, or... You know, I have this sort of fantasy about what death is actually like, and some of them are pretty weird. But I haven't experienced death. I'm not sure what it looks like. I mean, some people say it looks like a long white tunnel that you travel down. But I have to say I'm not afraid. This book really helped me be ready. And I'm not bitter. I mean, I know I love sex. I know that I love sex, and, and that means that that was important to me. I'm not sure that I can be bitter about that. I just know that that was important to me. I, I, 
I feel sort of, you know, shoot, I missed this a little, but, you know, but there's guys that are 80 years old that, that feel maybe the same way, you know, and that's just part of life. Um, to me, what's important is to remain healthy and to stay health healthy and to stay healthy throughout your life. So, I guess you could say it's an issue of quality as opposed to quantity. Okay, we have an, another question here. I wanted to ask Ray something. How do you work, when you work with AIDS Rochester, counseling and giving education, how, how is that work? What is that like in the community? Does everybody come for help or what? Okay, fine, good question. AIDS Rochester, you're probably aware, was established to respond to the problems of AIDS here in the community. And three, four times a year, they'll host a retreat where people can get away for an intense weekend of learning about AIDS. And can discuss issues like what to do if you meet a person who has AIDS, how you can be supportive and helpful and facilitative with and for people with AIDS. And there's a variety of people here in Rochester, deaf people with HIV, or who perhaps have ARC, AIDS-related complex, or full-blown AIDS. And we don't have sufficient interpreters here in the community, uh, not enough skilled signers. And we find that we need to have deaf people who can meet and care for the deaf community. And we're starting to see more and more deaf people involved in these efforts. Certainly interpreters are also included, but we're hoping in the future we can provide services with a, a direct provision of services without interpreters. And we hope to be able to have those kinds of resources. That's really important. In New York, we have a deaf AIDS project I mean, you really should have something like that here. You know, a deaf AIDS project of some sort to have educational uh, programs or uh, a network of services so you'd know where to get things, um, how you can get social security benefits, um, how do you get uh, a buddy system, and all the different services that might be available. That's the kind of work that some people are doing in New York City. It's been going on for about a, a year now. I mean, you can't announce this to the world all of a sudden, you know. It says to start small, and, and you learn what to do, and then you start out. For example, being a buddy or a caretaker, which is one service we have. This is a, a person that uh, is sort of a friend. They want to be helpful. I mean, they don't, like, weep and wail and grieve. I mean, they have their own problems, too. I mean, it's not like they have to stop their life to help caretake of someone, someone else. So they have to learn about all these issues in order to be a caretaker. I mean, they don't have to give up their own life in order to help other people. And, you know, what, what we all need is really some time for peace and quiet to think about all this. Yeah, if any deaf people here tonight are interested in working with persons with AIDS, please see me after the show tonight or get in touch with AIDS Rochester. Either it'd be fine, and please feel free to approach me tonight later after the show. Okay, we have a question over here. I have two questions for each of you. One question for each of you. Many, many people have been diagnosed with AIDS, and they are sent to practitioners to be tested. I've done a survey of different groups, of different grassroots deaf people, of different ages, and try to identify the different problems they have. They're feeling very alone. I'm, I've asked how much awareness they've had, and it's, I've noticed that their attitude is very condescending. They feel that they can't ask questions. There's one old woman in particular. I asked her if she would mind writing out an, an, a survey. And she said, well, I'll have to ask my husband first. And the husband said, no. 
so this, I couldn't complete this survey. And I'm wondering, how can I convince people that there's nothing wrong with, um, with expressing their feelings about AIDS? Oh. That's a tough one. To summarize, sort of, uh, uh, Gallaudet, or it's Schools for the Deaf, like NTID, they have, they're sometimes sort of like closed communities. Sort of like a fishbowl, you know? Everybody's sort of eyeing one another. You know, they check your personal characteristics out very carefully, and it's very difficult to change in an environment that's sort of like a fishbowl. You're stuck. I mean, everybody's, you know, in there with you, and they all seem to be watching. You know, once something gets out, you feel like it's, it's the entire fishbowl knows what's going on. So that's an attitude that we need, really need to change within our community. I thought you had another question for Ray. Oh. Um, we had another question for you, too, Sam. That's right. Your first question. Um, it's true that I am a quite a private person. I did tell my friends, you know, I'm sorry, but I wanted to tell you I have AIDS. <laughs> I didn't tell 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 of them, but I told my friends, and the word got out. They all know. Some of them thought I died two years before they even found out I had AIDS. <laughs> they thought that I was already dead, and they were shocked that I was still alive. They said, I thought you were dead. Well, what are you talking about? And it was even before I'd been diagnosed as having AIDS. I mean, I didn't go around warning people and saying, you better be careful, you better watch out. I mean, I just try to be peaceful. I don't have the time for that sort of effort. I don't have that kind of energy flow to pursue that kind of uh, hassling people. I mean, if people come to my home, then I'm willing to talk with them. And when I get too tired, I sleep. I okay. Oh, I'm <coughs> sorry, Ray. Uh, Ray, <laughs> wanted to respond? I'd respond to your question about old people or elderly people who feel they can't get AIDS, that they're just totally in error. Of course elderly people can get AIDS. I recently went to the funeral of a man who was 79 years old who had AIDS. Uh, he died. He'd gotten it from a blood transfusion. But certainly, older people can get AIDS, and their value system is very different from younger generations. You've seen Sam sharing some experiences about his sex life here in front of a priest. How many of your parents would be willing to do that? Young people certainly have very different values today than some of the older people do. And I strongly agree with Sam that we need to respect everyone's values and respect them as people. We can't be judging people and we can't be analytical in that way. Unborn babies can have AIDS and men and women of all different ages. Everyone can get AIDS. Certainly, uh, older people can, and some refuse to admit it. I'm curious. I'd like to ask how much you might think you know about AIDS. How do you, well, perhaps first, how do you think you can get it? What are the two or three ways you think you can get it? Sex, okay, that's one. What's another way you can get AIDS? Drugs, IV drug use, sharing needles, right? What's another way you can get it? through blood transfusions. There's another new way that you can get AIDS. Through pregnancy, the mother can pass it along to the child um, during breastfeeding. That's sort of the, the recent finding. I'm happy that you know more about this. OK, we have a question back here. Hold on. OK, go. Matt, yeah. Okay. When AIDS started years ago, a lot of, there was a lot of media attention because it was, hit, was hitting people for the first time and it shocked people and scared people. And it was also labeled the homosexual disease and people who were not gay thought, oh, well, this won't happen to me. It's the homosexual community's problem. As we have become more and more familiar and aware of this disease, we are realizing that 
it's really disease for everyone. However, even now, there are still concerns about people all over who still have feelings that it's a homosexual problem. <coughs> Do you have a message to people who are not gay? Good question, wonderful question. First of all, I am first human. And I was born a baby, just like you all. When I was born, I was just like you, crying and wailing, just like the rest of you. The same story that we all had. We grew up the same, just like children. And what was different was our personal characteristics, and that was all. I mean, why are some people gay? Why are some people straight? There's an easy answer. Why is there the sun? Why is there the moon? Why are some things black and why are some things white? Why are some things cold and some things hot? I mean, all different kinds of dualities, you know, how do you define them? Or how do you, why are they all there? I mean, without the sun, we wouldn't have the moon. You wouldn't know about the moon. You'd never know it was even there. With the sun and the moon, now people are asking why there's two. They want more. They want more. Th this opposition helps people draw uh, comparisons. I mean, there are some people who are straight. I mean, some people say, that's boring. And they say, oh, gay people, how can, how can people take a man's penis in their mouth? Or how can someone? have oral sex with a woman. I mean, it's no big deal, folks. We're all human first, and that's all. I mean, I could go on with all these words and all these things, but the words just help define our fears. And the fear itself is sort of like a disease. You look at the fear, you, you look at the disease with fear, and you develop more and more panic, and, and just your fear increases and increases. And it's really not necessary. Just look at the disease and find out what it is and learn about it. And you don't need this fear. You can put this stuff aside. I mean, there's no need for panic here. It's just a disease that we have to learn about. The fear does not help you. I mean, fear of big gay people, what is that going to do? I mean, <laughs> gay men like men's penises. That's all about it. That's really what it's all about. Does that answer your question? <laughs> that explanation really makes more sense to me than many of the preachings I've heard from a lot of the church hierarchy. Thank you. So you're saying that all of these dualities and oppositions cause a nice balance in, in the world, and that way we're not too overloaded in any one direction. I mean, it's good to have gay people. If there weren't gay people, it wouldn't be a full, it wouldn't be a complete world. Do you get it? I mean, if we didn't, it, there'd be so much overpopulation if we didn't have gay people. So this provides a balance in our population growth. So you're saying perhaps uh, choosing a gay lifestyle is a good birth control method. Okay, um, we have another question here. How do people who don't have AIDS view people with AIDS? Are they comfortable with each other? Um, do they associate with each other? Could you make a comparison? And I think they feel comfortable with one another. Uh, there are groups of people that happen to have cancer or heart attacks or different diseases. I mean, I mean, it's impossible not to have any disease. I mean, no one's free of disease. I mean, everybody has some little sort of disease. So, I mean, I would accept both kinds of people, really. I mean, they're human first. They're really human, and that's what we need to focus on. I have a heart. Well, maybe some people don't have any heart. It's important to remember that sometimes when I analyze myself and think about things, 
And I, you know, I wonder if I'm, if I'm so good at living with AIDS. It's been a year and a half now. And when I, when I think about it, I realize that it is possible to live with AIDS. I was born deaf. Was my mother's answer grief? I mean, of course, you know. Did my mother say that it was God's punishment or something? I mean, I was just a naive little baby. I didn't know anything at all, at all. When I was two years old, I learned that I was deaf. And when my mother learned I was gay, I mean, she grieved and she went to a psychologist and did the whole trip. And I said, I'm happy about this. People in deaf schools and, and other places have given me a hard time. I mean, Bernie even has had this experience of people giving him a hard people, you know, giving me a hard time because I'm gay. And I said, I'm happy about this. I'm puzzled by this. And some, some people say, oh, you're some kind of fag dancer. You know, and they give me a lot of insults and a hard time for all this stuff. I mean, you know, and a lot of other people said you can't dance because you're deaf. And they said I couldn't do a lot of other things because I was deaf. And now I'm a gay dancer. So, you know, these experiences have really made me tough. I mean, the insults just bounce off at this point. You know, I don't even respond to them. I don't argue with them. I just sort of give them this nod. And I've really become tough about it. And when I learned that I had AIDS, I was a tough case at that point. I mean, I was really strong. My strength had built up, and I was quite strong at that point. I mean, I'm soon to die, but I'm still strong. Okay, we just have a quick time here. Do you have a response, Ray? Perhaps could you elaborate a little bit on the medication you're taking now, and has that been helpful, or have you stopped? What's going on with that? There's these pills that I take. They're yellow and pink, and, well, there's actually quite a few that I pop. <laughs> Maybe I can tell you a little bit about them. Oh, I have to tell you, Sam, that our time has run out, so if you can just quickly go through this. Okay, the pills are called AZT. When I was told that I had to take this, I didn't really want to, because I felt I was a strong person, and I didn't really want medicine. So I tried this stuff called AZT. It comes in pill form. And it didn't really work so well. It made me, uh, it gave me an upset stomach, and I really didn't like it, and it caused me to be weak. And since I've been taking that drug, or uh, since then, I have not been taking any drugs. And I prefer that. I'm living without medicine. With the medicine, I was uh, drowsy and, and didn't feel well. OK, so I see you have an attitude of survival here. So I have to tell you that our time has run out now, and so we need to take a break. And thank you. We'll be right back. portion of Hey Listen has been sponsored by Aladdin's Natural Eatery. Aladdin's Natural Eatery. All natural soups and salads. Greek specialties. Fresh squeezed juices and imported beers from all over the world. Fine Middle Eastern dining after five at 141 State Street. Middle Eastern cuisine for the gourmet, the vegetarian, and the health food enthusiast. I'd like to thank both of you, Sam and Father Ray, for sharing your in-depth experiences with me. It's very inspiring, and it's helped all of us to feel very comfortable. Thank you so much. And it really means a lot to, to us to have you here. Thank you. It's really important that we all realize that we're human first. And I'm not just a person with AIDS. Not just, I, it's not that I just have AIDS. It's so true. Thank you.
James Garner is a con man just out to make a dishonest buck. Watch the bullets fly when you support your local gunfighter. Monday at 8, only on 31 UHF. What is the key to permanent weight control? Is the answer carefully watching everything you eat, staying on a strict diet and counting every calorie? Perhaps getting on an exercise program or walking an hour every day, or maybe following a complicated...